The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. The equivalent cost of manufacturing in China right now, as best as we can determine, is in the order of a dollar, dollar three, dollar five, somewhere in that range, with the error bars. Uh, so keep those numbers in your head as we dive into price, uh, because now we're going to be talking about what the market is, is uh, offering to pay uh, and, and what that uh, spread is between the cost and the price. So um, you have uh, in your uh, slide deck a list of different websites uh, I guess you have webby sits. Um, you have websites, email listservs, and blogs, and Twitter feeds, different uh, sources of information for collecting data from uh, uh, PV. And I should add one more to this list, which uh, wasn't on there, but um, should be there, uh, pbinsights.com. Um, this is where you can find uh, pretty up-to-date uh, spot prices for wafers, cells, modules, and so forth. Uh, does anybody know what a spot price is? What, what, what does it mean, a spot price? Spot price means I'm desperate to buy. I need to buy it right now. I pick up a phone and call somebody and say I'm willing to pay you. Um, so there's no long-term contract involved. It's usually a one-time deal. Um, that's a spot price. A long-term contract, on the other hand, says, uh, no, no, really. I have a factory. It's 100 megawatts, and I need a wafer supply for five years. Um, let's lock, lock ourselves into a price, uh, maybe revisit it every two and a half years. But, but that's a long-term uh, contract. Um, so these are spot prices, and they provide a very variety of information. Um, the information for today is free. Uh, if you want historical data, you have to sign up, become a member, and pay. Uh, but there are uh, other websites like this, um, various consulting groups that acquire and gather information, PB Insights. So you have a, a variety of different sites to, to grab information. could be useful for your class projects. Um, we're going to talk again about the dynamics of, of, of price, and uh, that is driven in large part by, well, we agreed to call it different things. Um, support mechanisms, tax breaks, incentives, but in reality, they're, they're support for PV. Um, recognizing that with a uh, $1.30, $1.10 cost, and then you add on top of that the profit margin, um, even if you assume a very meager margin of 15%, um, you're, and then the balance of systems, and then the installation costs on top of that, you're not reaching grid parity in the majority of markets, not with that sort of cost structure today. Uh, with, with innovation and moving forward into the future and scale, uh, we'll get there, I'm, I'm fairly confident. But today we don't have uh, the cost structure necessary to match, say, a subsidized coal-fired power plant. So there are a variety of different uh, support mechanisms, a variety of different subsidies in different um, uh, uh, countries and, and different states within the United States. And you can think about these as the carrot, the stick, and the hybrid. Uh, the carrot meaning the, um, the margin enhancement, the stick being uh, the, the, the penalty if um, you produce too much carbon, for instance, and some uh, variety of mixtures uh, between the two. So in terms of margin enhancement, the carrot, uh, what mechanisms exist? Uh, let me break it down very simply into, uh, we'll look in two different uh, categories. We'll look at what the United States has mostly done, which are tax relief and grants and soft loans. So let's, let's describe what that means. Um, so if I, when I bought the panels on top of the house in 2007, 2000 and, yeah, 2007, um, we paid out of the box somewhere in the order of seven to eight dollars per watt peak. And uh, after tax, re, uh, tax rebate uh, coming from the federal government uh, and some additional support from the state of Massachusetts, uh, the final price tag wound up being um, from, say, 18,000 plus down to about uh, 12 to 14,000. Uh, and then there's uh, revenue coming in from uh, uh, offsets and so forth. So this is uh, a one-time deal. I could have installed those panels in my basement and still gotten a tax break, right? Because it's per watt peak, not per kilowatt hour produced. Um, the rebates based on carbon emissions is based on the amount of energy it produces. That gives you an incentive to maximize the uh, efficiency of the installation. But just a one-time tax rebate doesn't. However, what the one-time tax rebate allows you to do is decrease the upfront sticker price. Right? So if, if I'm trying to sell you a, a system on your house, uh, US installers are convinced that it's a lot easier to sell you the system if the price tag is lower. 
right? If I can say, well, this is the real cost, but, but wait, wait, there's more. <laughs> we'll give you this tax rebate, this tax rebate, draw a line. The final amount that you pay is this lower amount right here. Um, the other mechanism of, of, finance, of, of, of margin enhancement, if you will, is what's called a feed-in tariff. Now, a feed-in tariff works as follows. A feed-in tariff says, okay, if you're paying, a, say, in the state of Massachusetts, we don't have one, uh, we don't have a feed-in tariff here in Massachusetts, but imagine if we did. Um, you as a residential customer are paying 18 cents per kilowatt hour for your electricity. But if you have solar panels on your roof, the, the utility, if you will, the state of Massachusetts is willing to pay you 30 cents per kilowatt hour for that PV electricity, recognizing the additional value that that PV is adding to the state, reducing the, uh, the, the, the need for additional transmission lines, reducing the amount uh, of investment in new coal-fired power plants, reducing the health uh, detriment to the local communities around the, 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 the coal plant, and so forth. So uh, a feed-in tariff is meant to give an incentive, a market pull incentive, if you will, to install PV on your house or in a field. Uh, and this is the mechanism that has been in use in Germany. And because it's a market-driven mechanism, it rewards the most efficient systems that are out there. Uh, if you install that system in your basement, you're not going to be producing kilowatt hours, and hence you're not going to benefit from the feed-in tariff. Now, it's a tricky business to decide where exactly to fit that feed-in tariff, right? If you go too low, people aren't going to move. They're going to say, eh, no, not enough. Not enough to make me want to install solar. If the feed-in tariff is too high, you're going to get this massive onrush of people coming to install solar, and, and now you're going to have to finance it, right? Uh, and, and, and the money has to come from somewhere. In Germany, the money comes from the rate payers, not from the state. What means that if you install solar panels in your house, all of us have to help pay for the electricity that you sell back to the grid. So our rate goes up from 18 cents per kilowatt hour to say 18.2 cents per kilowatt hour. And in the beginning, we don't notice it at all. But then if Joe starts putting solar panels up as well, um, and then let's say 50% of us put solar panels up, now obviously we're paying a lot more. Um, and uh, it gives a, more of an incentive for more people to put the solar panels up on the roof. And of course the price goes up. So the feed-in tariff is a very, uh, it, it is a market-driven incentive, and hence it is very skillful at rewarding the most efficient installations. But from a government point of view, it requires very uh, structured, uh, rigorous, and deft manipulation of the feed-in tariff rate, the decline of the rate versus time, to ensure that uh, A, uh, the installers aren't reaping an enormous profit, <laughs> and B, uh, that, there's, uh, that the system doesn't become unsustainable over time that the burden on, on the ratepayers is not so great that uh, they're shouldered in for 20 years paying these excessively high rates. So it rewards first adopters. It, it allows the um, market to uh, predict uh, the, 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 the versus rate of growth what the uh, reward rate will be. And it allows you to glide into grid parity. Right? So we're at a situation today where we're not at grid parity. Uh, in, in 10, 20 years, we're likely to be there. And so the, the, the declining rate of the feed-in tariff allows you to kind of glide back in. In the United States, the tax rebate, um, unfortunately, because of the way our political system works, it tends to get renewed um, in a very frequent rate. Um, every two years, it seems, it's going up for debate and discussion. Should we continue it? Should we not continue it? It becomes a big political struggle just to get it passed. And uh, as a result, everybody uses up their energy trying to pass this thing and, and renew it, as opposed to saying, gee, what's the best way to decrease this over time so that we can kind of glide into grid parity? So we have some issues in the US uh, more related to how our political system doesn't work. Um, but uh, there, there are examples of, of this throughout uh, the world in terms of what are uh, states and countries doing to enhance the margins to create market pull incentives Right, to, to allow solar to be installed on the grid. And the panels that are installed could come from anywhere. Right? They could be produced in, in, uh, in Guam, <laughs> uh, and, and they could qualify for, uh, for the feed-in tariff. So it, it doesn't dis discriminate against uh, particular regions of the world. Uh, another thing to add here, another thing to add is that uh, this is just the support from uh, the state, from uh, the, the uh, public sector. From the private sector, what is possible? Well, what is possible is what's called a power purchase agreement. And this was alluded to during our tour, right? What is a power purchase agreement? 
a power purchase agreement is, instead of, instead of you buying a system and putting it up on your roof and having to pay all that money up front, what you do is you enter an agreement with the installer. They will put the panels up on your roof for free because they're getting the financing, say, from Morgan Stanley, from the Bank of Joe. Uh, so the Bank of Joe is, is, is financing the panels on your roof. Uh, so the panels went up on your roof. You didn't pay a penny, but you inked an agreement with me, the installer, because I just borrowed money from Joe at a certain interest rate, and you inked an agreement with me that you'll pay a certain amount for your electricity over the next 10, 15, 20 years, however long it is, usually 12, and that rate may be a little bit higher than what it is today, but it's certainly going to be lower if, if current uh, price inflation inc uh, continues uh, for the price of electricity. It will certainly be lower than what uh, the price of electricity will be in, in 12 years. And so you'll make money. I'll make money because there's a spread between the rate at which I'm borrowing the money from the bank and what you're paying me for those panels, right? for, for renting the panels on the roof, if you will, for buying the electricity from those panels. So everybody's making money, and the bank's making money, obviously, because they're charging an interest rate on the loan. Uh, and, and so with those financing schemes, right, where it's called a power purchase agreement, bank loans the money to the installer, the installer loans the panels on the roof of the customer, and the customer pays a, pays a, a fixed price for the electricity, that uh, allows everybody to make money from day one, as long as there's capital in play. It requires capital to be in play, meaning it requires the Bank of Joe to be willing to lend money to me, the installer. If the Bank of Joe doesn't want to lend, then that isn't an option. And so you see many of these very large deals being forged with the investment banks um, uh, between uh, uh, large uh, installers, say uh, SunPower, uh, Sun Edison, and so forth, and, uh, and New York City. Uh, it's becoming an increasingly popular form of financing solar panels. Um, you may stand to make more money as an individual by buying the panels up front, because then you reap the entire benefit of your investment. You're not sharing the investment benefit with the installer. You're not sharing the investment benefit with the bank. <laughs> but uh, that requires, again, access to capital. And not everybody has a spare fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 lying around to put solar on the roof. Question? You, what's the incentive? Yep. So over the past 10 years, say from 2000 to 2009, uh, in the uh, state of Massachusetts, uh, the price of electricity increased by 15%. So if you compare what, what did it take for, uh, per kilowatt hour at the beginning and the end, normalized for inflation, 15% inflation in the price of electricity. And there are a variety of reasons for that. Um, we're at the end of a natural gas pipeline. Um, so even if the price of natural gas goes down, uh, it takes a lot to get it to us. Um, sometimes shipments go in by boat, other times up the actual pipeline itself. Um, and then uh, other forms of, of fossil fuel, oil especially, uh, has experienced a rise in prices over the last few years. Uh, and so for a variety of reasons, um, including those and including a difficulty in transmission, including uh, limited new power plants coming online, um, the price has gone up. And uh, as a result, um, if you project forward, you could say, okay, uh, let's, let's hedge our bets here. Um, we can estimate that the price is going to go up another 15% uh, between now and the next decade. Um, so what I'm going to do is say, this is the price today, this is the price tomorrow, uh, in 10 years, right? I'm going to sell you electricity here. And so it's, it's almost like the deal, I don't know if anybody, anybody uh, signs up for the, na the natural gas uh, lock-in price during winter with NSTAR. You probably receive the envelope in the mail, or maybe your landlord does, but um, NSTAR, the utility company around uh, this area, will allow you to lock in a price for natural gas per therm, per unit uh, of natural gas over the winter, um, that is slightly above the market rate in the fall, with the understanding that prices tend to spike during winter, and you're able to hedge, you're able to uh, uh, reduce risk. And so really what it is is a risk mitigation strategy. And it's good enough for most people. Uh, I know two people on our street alone have entered power purchase agreements as means of financing their solar installations. So uh, let's, let's discriminate once again between the, um, the private sector uh, that's trying to sell you the panels. It's like, Omar, you have to buy my panels. Let me sweeten the deal here. You don't have to pay a penny up front. We'll introduce a power purchase agreement. 
versus what the state is doing, right? Or whether that's the, the national government or the state level is doing to try to get the installers and other industries growing within their uh, within the organization, and, and as well, um, several of the EU states uh, meeting their Kyoto Protocol obligations to reduce carbon emissions by a certain amount by, by 2020. So um, we're going to do a deep dive into the German case, just because it is so interesting and so exemplary uh, as, as, in, in terms of driving uh, or increasing the amount of PV on the grid. And uh, one thing to note just up front, this is the installation map of Europe. Insulation being the solar irradiance, the total solar resource available, uh, shown in this barely distinguishable uh, uh, little legend down here, blue being low, red being high. And Germany is right here, as they would say, von Herzen Europa, the, from the heart of Europe, right there, uh, right in the middle. And um, this is the insulation comparison, again, between Germany and the United States. Same scale over here, a um, lot less solar resource in Germany even in, then in the northeastern uh, part of the United States. Yet, there was about half of all solar panels installed here last year. Why? Um, well, first off is high electricity prices. Secondly, there is a feed-in tariff that uh, gives an incentive for solar to be installed in the grid. So what I'm going to do is go over um, several slides coming from, the, um, from a ministry in, in, in Germany uh, describing the growth of solar and the growth of other renewables on the grid in response to this feed-in tariff. So uh, the renewable energy uh, resources, if you will, uh, as, as a share of the total energy supply in Germany, um, the goal by uh, 2020 uh, is this white uh, bar right here. And if we look at um, uh, the share of renewable sources in total gross electricity consumption, you can see that uh, it's, it's getting there, right? 17% uh, versus a minimum of 35. So working toward those targets pretty well and climbing uh, from... 2000 to 2010, uh, more than doubling, almost tripling. This is the uh, electricity, heat supply, and fuel supply breakdown. If we just look at the electricity component right here, since that's uh, where PV uh, falls and, and, uh, and contributes, you can see it's uh, growing. Um, this again, uh, what you have to keep in mind is this 17% of um, electricity consumption coming from renewables, the 17% is uh, this amount here, right, the yellow bar. And uh, we're looking at something in the range of 103 uh, terawatt hours over the course of a, a year in 2010. And out of those 103 terawatt hours, breaking it out into PV, biomass, hydro, and wind, you can see that PV is accounted for a relatively small fraction of that total. Um, the, the largest by far has been wind. Uh, wind reached. Uh, or has reached lower prices of electricity faster than, than solar has. Um, differences between the technologies, shall we say. And as a result, the grid penetration of wind has um, uh, preceded that of solar. But solar is uh, growing quite a bit. And this is averaged over the entire country. And as I mentioned before, there are certain regions within Germany, uh, as you might guess, um, down here, for instance, right, that have experienced larger grid penetration of solar than others, just because they have a larger solar resource available to them. So, um, so this is the little fraction here growing of, of solar electricity. Uh, these here are the different legislations that are being passed, um, regulating the feed-in tariff. Now, uh, the feed-in tariff is scheduled to reduce gradually uh, for each year. Let me show you how that works. Um, we'll go back to um, this uh, German energy blog uh, by uh, two of our uh, uh, energy law experts in Germany. Um, and this describes for you the German feed-in tariffs as of 2010, um, the Renewable Energy Sources Act, uh, essentially one of those uh, legislations that have passed. And it just shows you what you can expect over uh, a variety of different um, sectors, hydro, landfill gas, and you can see it's, it's broken into very specific details, different sizes of installations, um, different types of, of plants, and so forth. This is bio, um, geothermal, onshore wind, offshore wind, solar radiation, roof-mounted facilities, electricity produced uh, used within the building facility, freestanding facilities, and um, digression. This means, um, digression means how much does it go down per year? This is based on their best estimate for the growth of grid penetration of PV. 
they're trying to guess in the future how much PV is going to come onto the grid by a certain date, and hence what the price will be as well, and thus reduce their feed-in tariff accordingly. And since it's impossible to look into a crystal ball and nail it, right, especially since this is a nonlinear system, the price depends on the feed-in tariff. The feed-in tariff depends on the price. Right? So there's a little bit of that interaction going on. Um, they have to reassess from time to time what the new rates are going to be. And that's why um, you have these various, uh, well, aside from the initial, you have these various reevaluations from time to time uh, looking at the feed-in tariff. Now, um, what has happened more recently? There was a reevaluation in January 2009, another mid-2010, right, that decreased it even further. So uh, more recently, this unfortunately only goes to 2010, but more recently there have been more significant, stronger cuts to the feed-in tariff in Germany in response to a few things. Um, so let me go over this real quick. I'll get back to that in a second. First off, this is the payment of fees in millions of euros versus time. Right, that the rate payers are paying in total. So that winds up being something in the order of 135 euros per head in Germany. Um, and that's not spread equally amongst everybody per year. That's not spread equally amongst everybody. That's uh, as well, um, uh, their industry bears more, obviously, than the residential customer would. But it's a line item of a few euros on your utility bill per month uh, as, as a customer. And that begins to add up. Uh, so uh, Germany has begun putting on the brakes <laughs> Uh, on the incentives. Uh, and further, uh, if they look at uh, how much they've installed versus other countries, again, this is the same chart we showed last class, their portion of all new installations is very large. And so they begin looking around to the rest of the world saying, hey, folks, we don't have a lot of sun here. Um, why aren't you doing your part, too, to put solar on your grids? Um, compounded by the fact that uh, now they have a growing percentage of uh, manufacturing that's not in Germany, right? The German the percentage of German manufacturing of the PV modules themselves has stayed more or less flat. And so Germany is sitting here thinking, OK, we're in a financial crisis right now. Um, something has to give. Uh, let's put a damper on this feed-in tariff for a little bit until, uh, un until the, the situation straightens itself out and until there's more growth in other markets uh, besides just Germany. Let's try to. Uh, reduce the incentive that we give to put uh, PV on our grid uh, and maybe increase the share of PV going on to US, uh, China, and so forth, other big markets around the world, uh, so that we're not bearing the sole burden of trying to reduce the cost of PV to grid parity. And um, as, a result, uh, the, uh, as a result of this, the decline in the feed-in tariff in Germany, and as a result of a massive amount of new production capacity coming online in China and Taiwan, we're now in an oversupply condition. What means an oversupply condition? What it means is that there, is more, there are more PV modules available today than there are customers to buy them at the given prices that are available. And the price is dictated in part by the feed-in tariff. And so what you've seen is, uh, sorry, I'm just going to drive through these slides right over here until I get to that one. So what you see is that chart that Secretary Chu presented yesterday during his talk. Right. This was in uh, first quarter of 2008. This is when the market began softening. Um, right around here, the, the uh, German feed-in tariffs really started going down tremendously. Um, Chinese manufacturing and Taiwanese manufacturing really started ramping up around here, uh, 2007, 2008. And so what happened? This here is price, not cost, price. Right, so this is being driven by market dynamics, not, by, not solely by the cost of manufacturing. So we have uh, what people are willing to pay for the dollars a watt. So if the feed-in tariff is going down in Germany, which is uh, acquiring 50% of the modules in the market, that means that the price has to come down as well. If you're going to be able to sell your modules, you're going to have to sell them at a lower price because the feed-in tariff is now lower. At the same time, you have now more supply on the market, and you have companies competing against each other to get their modules out in the market. And so prices are going to come down by that as well. So what this chart is telling you, let's look at the blues, for instance. Let's start here. These are estimates made in 2008. And this blue line extending forward is the estimated price, not cost, the estimated price of what a PV module would sell for projected forward to the end of 2010. Then we enter 2009, the reds here. And the prices, the real prices, continue to drop precipitously. Again, here we have the analyst's estimates for what the, the price is going to be moving forward to 2000, end of 2011. 
And you can see that the analysts' estimates are always above the actual prices over the last three years, which means that the prices, actual prices, have fallen faster than anybody or the analysts expected to. Maybe there were some smart people among, in, 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 the, in the actual industry who saw this uh, coming in quite the same way. But what this means is the prices have come down a lot faster than what people expected. Um, I don't think people expected that Germany would cut the feed-in tariff rate quite as, as large as it did uh, in 2009 and, and 10. Uh, and some people who haven't been paying attention to the market might not have expected as much supply to be available from China as there is today. Um, those people should have been paying better attention. But that combination of, of factors resulted in a much faster price decline than what people saw coming. And as a result, companies that were formed in, say, 2007, 2008, and got venture capital and saw one of these lines right here and said, oh, we're going to be able to intersect them in 2010, are now looking at these sorts of prices here, right? And saying, oh, gee, we're, we're not going to be able to intersect them in 2010. It's going to be more like 2015 before we get our production costs low enough to compete at those prices. And so the venture capitalists are now sitting back thinking, so let me get this straight. You came to us three years ago and told us that you'd be cost competitive by 2010. But now the story is you're going to be cost competitive by 2015? This kind of smells fishy. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I want to lend you an additional round here, especially if I have to wait another five years before you're profitable. Let me just cut my losses and, and pick up shop and leave, uh, and your company will go under. Uh, so that's happened a few times. Right? That's happened in a high-profile way, uh, it, which we all know about, Solyndra. Um, it's also happened in a few other uh, uh, companies, uh, SpectraWatt, um, uh, even uh, earlier ones at the beginning of the financial crisis, OptiSol and others. So um, the companies that are surviving right now, there are still more than 100 startup companies in the United States, um, dozens and dozens of startup companies in solar. Those smart ones that are surviving are, um, are usually in pre-production stage, right? So they don't have big manufacturing lines, hundreds, thousands of people to pay, um, uh, supply chains to pay for, and uh, customers evaporating. So they're not caught in that situation. Uh, that was Solyndra. They had a, a big production line. They had 1,100 people employed in that line. And they had uh, customers lined up. Uh, they had suppliers shipping in materials that they were converting into product. Um, and some of the customers disappearing or not willing to pay as high prices anymore. Uh, and that leads to a, a, a very difficult situation. You don't have a cash cushion. You, can't, you don't have any reserves in the bank. You have to sell your product, and you're not able to compete at these prices. Uh, it's a recipe for disaster if you're a mid-sized company. So small companies can survive in what I call spore mode, meaning they're, they're like a spore. They don't have that big manufacturing line to pay for. They can survive off grants. They can survive off venture capital. And their, their cash burn rate is very low. They're developing technologies. The big companies have cash cushions already. They have cash reserves. They might even be able to access uh, low interest rate loans from, from banks that, that borrow money at, at ridiculously low rates from the Treasury right now. Um, they may even have financial branches within their own company, like GE Finance, that can do that sort of thing. Um, but uh, so, so big, big companies are, are so far surviving. The really tiny companies are so far surviving. But the market dynamic is really hitting those mid-sized companies that already have a, a manufacturing line. And so you hear about layoffs. You hear about job losses. These are often the mid-sized companies just trying to enter, go back to spore mode <laughs> so they can survive this difficult period um, until prices equilibrate. And when we look at prices equilibrating, um, these are, these, let's, let's look at the price now. We're headed towards Q4 2011. Let's put a data point right here for Q4 2011. Let's do it right now. So we'll go back to um, here. And sorry about that. That was me registering a website. Um, that's um, for the project that Doug was working on. We'll go to PV Insights. And we're going to add the latest data point here. So solar wafer, this is silicon, this is wafer, this is cell. And this is module. All right, so this is our low. This is our high. These are all prices in dollars per watt peak, prices. Our low and our high and our average for, I guess, last update was yesterday. Um, the low, I can tell you this, this particular low number right here came from a tier three manufacturer in China 
what is tier one, tier two, C3? So tier one are brand names. Um, Ying Li, they advertised during the World Cup, right? Uh, Suntech, mentioned in Secretary Chu's presentation yesterday. Trina Solar, um, LDK, and so forth. These are tier one manufacturers, the big, uh, the big dogs. Um, tier three are companies you've never heard of, but are employing thousands of people and manufacturing modules uh, in the hundreds of megawatts range, perhaps even uh, uh, reaching a gigawatt scale. And because banks have never heard of them either, <laughs> Maybe that's an overstatement, but I'm, I'm making a point here. They're, they're not as well known. They're not as reliable from the bank's perspective. Right? Um, maybe they haven't been around as long. And it's questionable whether they're going to survive this difficult economic climate. Uh, they have difficulty to sell their product. The installers don't want to take their product. And so they have to undercut the competition. They have to, sell, uh, they have to leave money on the table. And selling at prices at $0.75 uh, dollars per watt. Now, what Doug's calculations are indicating, as you saw from the very beginning, that the, the cost of manufacturing in the US is around 130. The cost of manufacturing in China is around a dollar. And then you have to ship it over to the US. So if, if somebody is willing to sell you a module at 0.75 dollars per watt, that means that the price is below the cost. That means that that company is desperate to get rid of inventory. They must have modules stacking up in their, in their shipment yard. Uh, and they're unable to move them. And so the, the chief financial officer walks over and says, we've got to get rid of this stuff. It's costing us money. It, 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 it costs us money to keep this product on the books. Uh, sell it for whatever you have to sell it for to get rid of it. And as a consequence, they sell below cost, put it out into the market, and then, um, and then you have Solar World or US company coming to the Department of Commerce saying they're dumping product. Um, it's an unfair competition. According to the World Trade Organization, you can't sell at a price below your cost uh, in order to squeeze out and, and gain market share. So it's a really, uh, it's a complex situation right now. I've described for you in, in as much detail as I can um, my impression of what's happening in the world today. Um, this low uh, price right here of, one, of a 0.75 from a Chinese tier three manufacturer and the high price here coming from most likely a German uh, supplier uh, or US supplier selling a, what is known to be a very high quality, reputable product, uh, has been selling for the last 10 years, um, very reliable, uh, very few incidences of, of consumers uh, returning the product, and banks like that product. So they're, willing, they're able to extract a premium for their product. They're able to sell and move those modules at a higher price because they're more bankable. Um, this average right here is more representative of what uh, Chinese tier one manufacturers are currently selling for and what many of the uh, US and European, uh, uh, say, average module makers are, are having to compete against with costs on the order of $1.30. That's, that's the, the constriction right now. So if we add that one data point onto this chart right here, where we have uh, Q4 2011, we're solidly in Q4 right now, and we're at 0.98 with an error bar somewhere around here, right? So we're at 0.98. You see the prices are still coming down and will likely come down for uh, maybe another quarter before they start to stabilize. And as companies fail, as more companies leave the market, uh, you'll have consolidation of market share. You'll have the few remaining companies that had the large cash cushion that had the lowest cost structure survive and increase their market share and reduce the number of players out in the market. And probably prices will come back up afterwards because you can't continue selling below cost uh, for very long before you, everybody goes out of business. I saw a hand going up over there. Uh, I guess the, those prices, a transaction happened at that price, and that was just the ask price, the, the manufacturer. Uh, so um, these right here, I, I know that the 0.75, um, that was uh, a, a, an offer price. Yeah, so the, the, it was 0.85 um, during uh, Solar Power International at, um, uh, in, in, um, in Texas uh, about a month ago. Um, and it made a big splash, and everybody was, was, uh, was really awed by it. Uh, the 0.75 is news to me. It probably came up over the last week or so. And in response, most likely, to that, that company selling at 0.85, unable to move their product, going even lower in a desperate attempt just to get rid of their inventory. So these prices most likely are coming from uh, a, a few different routes. So uh, you can, you as an individual, can send uh, an email or fax over a, a request for a quote from 
any one of 100 module manufacturers around the world. And you will get a quote back or a, 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 an offer sheet back. And most likely what, what PV Insights is doing is, is some combination of that, kind of a guerrilla tactic, let's gather information, and uh, as well information gleaned from their installer base. So they have contacts to various installer companies. They keep the finger on the pulse over there, talking to their friends, saying, hey, how much, how much are they offering you the modules for? It's not like the stock market where, you know, the price saw that it's okay. Yeah, the, uh, the, the sell and the buy price are a little different. No, or currency exchange markets. No, this is, um, these are individual companies um, trying to assess what the market is willing to pay for their product. Uh, in the case on the low end, these are desperate customers trying to move, or des desperate producers trying to move product. And on the high end, these are, um, these are companies with high cost structures typically in the West, typically US and, and Germany, that have a reputation and they're clinging for as long as they can onto the high prices <laughs> for as long as they can do it uh, before the market finally says, you know what, I'm sorry. Um, We've been good friends. We worked together for the last 10 years. But honestly, I'm, I'm not going to buy at 145. Not when SunTech is offering me a module at, 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 at $1.05. And it's uh, comparable in quality. They've proven themselves. Uh, the, game, the, the days when uh, Chinese modules, all Chinese modules were inferior are over. Um, now we have several tier one Chinese manufacturers that have proven their modules out in the open market. Uh, there haven't, hasn't been a large number of recalls. Um, so I'm willing to take the risk with them. And uh, at that point, you'll start to see the, the higher uh, priced U.S. and in, in, in European products uh, begin to soften. Yeah? So if the oversupply condition doesn't get resolved in enough time, mm -hmm. does that have the potential to basically stall the entire industry? Hmm. And so how long would that take? Well, uh, keep in mind that this is just the module. Um, there's a whole other dynamic happening on the installation side. And the reason I'm not getting into that in too much detail is because it varies so much from country to country, although I will say a few comments before the end of class. Um, if the oversupply condition continues, uh, and if the feed-in tariffs continue to be low, um, what you'll see is a continued softening of the module price uh, into the point where almost all manufacturers are selling below manufacturing cost. Uh, they're all desperately trying to reduce manufacturing costs, reduce overhead. It's forcing them to innovate, at least on manufacturing innovation, faster. Not on product innovation, not on how do we design the cell differently, but more on the process innovation on the line of saying, gee, um, how do we mix the silver with the cheaper metal like aluminum in a ratio so that we, we save, we eke out half a cent per watt peak because any small fraction counts at this point. It's, it, we're desperate. And um, it's, it's really, uh, you, you can think of, of, of this oversupply condition as a bunch of horses running nose to nose uh, and, and which ones will begin falling out. Um, in the beginning, you could point to easy candidates. Uh, those have already begun to go by the wayside. Um, but now uh, you know, companies are burning through their cash cushion, um, reporting negative profits. Uh, you see right and left, even the, the Chinese tier one manufacturers are reporting negative earnings um, these, this last quarter. Uh, so that's a reflection not only of the oversupply condition, but also the fact that they're continuing to expand despite the oversupply condition. Uh, the, the idea being, well, we can withstand one, two, three, four quarters of losses as long as we consolidate market share. Once we emerge from this oversupply condition, we'll be able to increase prices a bit more and then return to a more uh, sustainable market. But we'll be the big dogs and everyone else will be out. Uh, so I, I think all companies right now are trying to play that game of, of, of survive, survive this oversupply condition, make it through. Some are able to continue growing, and other ones are just stagnant. So the stagnant ones are going to become niche players. They won't be the major players in the market. The ones who continue growing will be the 80, 90 percent of the market. So uh, U.S. doesn't do many feed-in tariffs. Um, this goes back to the U.S. case right here. So uh, due to lack of leadership at the national level, um, there are uh, a variety of state-level uh, incentives put forth. Right? So these are the policies. We kind of talked about this last class, but to dive into a bit more detail. The rebate programs for the renewables. Um, these are state programs plus the utility and or a nonprofit programs, utility, local, and or nonprofit programs only, and state programs only. Uh, so you see, for example, in, in the state of Massachusetts, we have um, 
uh, what used to be the, the Massachusetts Technology Collaborative. Um, there was a bit of a um, power struggle within the Mass State, and it got incorporated into a more centralized organization downtown. Um, the, uh, so that used to be an, a, a nonprofit organization, which is now more affiliated with the state. Um, the state also has a rebate. Uh, we have a very different set of do ways of doing things in, say, California, um, which has the, uh, a, a Clean Energy Commission that rates each module and gives you a rebate depending on what they rate the module as performing in California. So every state has its own way of doing things, and it becomes very complicated very quickly. Um, to enact a national uh, incentive beyond the tax rebate that is already offered today uh, is, is challenging in this political climate especially because anything that you would do to raise the cost of something, um, which most likely would come from some federal program. Right now, the Republican Party is demanding that there be an offset, a reduction in spending elsewhere within the government. And uh, many of the discretion, many of the places that are easy to cut have already been cut, right? And so you've gone through the fat, you're now hitting muscle, and pretty soon you're gonna be hitting bone. Um, so it, it's difficult to enact something that the government would pay for. Uh, it is even more difficult to enact something that the utilities and ratepayers would pay for at a national level because oftentimes those powers are delegated to the states and you would enter a big uh, a federal versus state uh, fight uh, over that, which would go to the courts most likely and be held up there for several years. Uh, there are about 18,000 different independent uh, jurisdictions within the United States um, governing how solar is, is added to the grid. And so what the Department of Energy has done, which I think is the wisest thing to do in, in, given this situation that we have, is to say, okay, we're not gonna force anybody to change, but we're going to give an incentive for people to change. And like they had in the Department of Education, a race to the top, where states competed against each other to implement best practices in education, they're having a similar program on the installation side of solar, uh, trying to get uh, various states to adopt the best practices to streamline uh, the permitting process to get uh, solar onto the grid in the most efficient way possible and hopefully reduce the installation costs associated with that. So uh, let's, let's turn our attention quickly to installation since I, I wanna give some time uh, to have people ask questions about their class projects since time is running very short. If you're hitting up against a, um, a, 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 a roadblock, I wanna make sure that uh, we resolve that. I'll say a couple of words about the installation. So a funny thing happened on Tuesday night. Uh, I met with a colleague from uh, Wisconsin, and he said, well, I met uh, the editor of, 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 I think it was an editor from one of the big journals, um, we'll protect the innocent, uh, and this was a very high impact journal, uh, scientific journal. And he said, well, the majority of the cost right now is in the installation side, not in the module, in solar. So I'm not going to be, uh, be interested in any papers to my journal that describe new concepts for PV modules. I'm interested in the installation side because that's where the majority of the cost is. And I went, oh my goodness, here's another one who can't distinguish between cost and price. <laughs> so um, the installation cost right now, let's focus on cost first and then we'll get to price. So the installation cost in the United States is partially reflective of the fact that we have those 18 thousand different ways of doing it here. Versus in Germany, there is one way to do it nationally. The federal government said, we are going to demand that everybody uh, in Germany uh, install in, in this protocol. And the paperwork is very, very brief. It's a couple of pages to, to get it installed. And the inspection is one. And so uh, Germany has a much more efficient system, and they've installed roughly six to seven times more solar than we have. And if you remember experience learning curves, with, when you have the, the reduction of, of, of cost, the more you do it, that means you have three doublings. Germany has three doublings over us. And even if you assume a, a very um, leisurely 20% reduction for each doubling, that means Germany is about the half of the cost as we are because they've done it more. They know how to do it more efficiently than we do. Okay, so I, that's, that's on the cost side. On the price side, on the price side, if you look around the US, you have some states like New Jersey, which had uh, an amazing incentive program for a while. And uh, California is as well quite generous. Uh, so there are certain states where it's almost like a gold mine. And so there's no incentive for the installer to reduce their price. Their costs can be going down, but their price can be maintained high. And usually, this isn't always the case, but in most industries, when prices are high, 
the industry becomes lazy. <laughs> now, this isn't always the case, but it is often the case. It is, is, it is not atypical that when the prices are high, the industry says, oh, prices are high. That's pretty good. Uh, I'm enjoying myself right now. I'm not going to be focused on cost reduction. It seems that at, at least the, the lower level managers suddenly become uh, fixated on cost reduction when it's too late. Right? When, when margins have already begun shrinking, when prices are collapsing, and when it's do or die for the company. Then, then all of a sudden cost becomes uh, imperative. Um, so there are very few companies. The ones that usually become leaders are the ones who recognize, gee, costs can't, or prices can't remain high forever. We have to reduce our costs now. And, and hey, it'll, it'll be even to our benefit because our margins will be greater. We'll be able to take advantage of this right now. And uh, build up some cash so that when the prices do collapse, we have, we have some buffer and we can survive the, the oversupply condition. So um, installers right now, I, I, I have to say I'm disappointed in, in uh, our installers in the United States uh, for not doing more uh, amongst themselves to reduce the amount of, of, of paperwork, to, for not taking leadership role in reducing the uh, paperwork burden and the, the true cost of installing PV on the balance of system Kaizen installation side. I think that's a very resolvable problem uh, you look to Germany, and you have residential systems going in for uh, below three euros per watt peak price, taking advantage of the low module prices right now, and the fact that the installation costs in Germany are low as well, uh, so because they've learned how to do it well, they've learned how to do it efficiently, and they've reduced their cost structure. So I personally, I, th I think there is innovation to be done on the installation side. I think there's a lot that can be done with prefabrication, maybe moving a robot out there that can assemble things in a big rack and in a crane that puts it on the roof as opposed to having 10 people going out to a house and spending a couple days putting panels on the roof. It's not that bad. Maybe it's more like a day. But it's still a very labor intensive uh, uh, industry right now in the US. Um, so more innovation can be done. But the lion's share, the lion's share of the installation price right now is driven by uh, what I would call just inefficiencies in the way uh, installation is done and inefficiencies in the way the permitting process is done, the paperwork is done. Um, so that's my uh, soapbox speech on installation. Uh, by all means, there is innovation to be done, and so don't, don't, don't give up on that side either. It's important. Um, it's where the rubber hits the road. But I think um, it, it's not, you can't just look at the, the price of modules today and the price of installing the system today in the United States and realize that 80% of the price right now is wrapped up in the installation and say, oh, well, there isn't any more innovation to be done on the module side. Uh, you have to look at cost. And you have to recognize that the module cost is driven by the efficiency of the module. And the installation cost as well will be driven by the efficiency of the module. And so the module being the engine of the system is still very, very, very important. And so the work that folks are doing on new PV materials especially uh, is, is, uh, is important.